Hey everyone, welcome to Things We Said Today, a bi-weekly Beatles podcast where we discuss anything and everything about the Beatles, together and solo, and all things Beatles related as well. I'm Darren DeVivo from WFUV Radio in New York City at 90.7 FM and also WFUV.org. I've been at WFUV for eons, it seems like, and um, now here with you here on Things We Said Today, not alone, but with my good friends and show co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know from all of the Beatles-related radio and other radio, too, that he's been doing for even longer than me. Uh, these days, keeps himself busy with his uh, radio program, Every Little Thing. And also, he's got Ken Michaels Radio, which is his YouTube page, where he's constantly interviewing folks. Actually, I would think uh, these days, I could be wrong about this, Ken Michaels Radio takes up more of your time than the the syndicated show every little thing at the moment that's true all right very observant so at the moment <laughs> yeah every little thing syndicated radio show ken michaels radio youtube page ladies and gentlemen ken michaels hey darren hello and hello hello and the man or one of them responsible for what is going to go down as being the definitive biography of paul mccartney Although this particular book is part of it, modeling it there, Alan Cozen, co-author of the McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 1973. And I see Ken's got it over there as well. Back there. Um, Alan Cozen's been a music journalist and a critic and an author for even longer than Ken and I have been doing our thing on the radio and uh, he's our other host, of course, here on Things We Said Today, Alan Cozen. How are you, Alan? Great, Darren. And hello, Ken. And hello, everyone out there. And a happy holidays to everyone as well. As we sit here, uh, it is Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah to all. Uh, what night is this? Is night three? Three that we're recording? Uh, this, this show, which will be our final show in all likelihood of 2022. Uh, Christmas coming in just a matter of days. And uh, before I throw things over to Ken with the news, what we're going to do on our show today is put a wrap on 2022 by talking about some of the things we enjoyed and some of the things we're thankful for uh, that happened in the Beatles world uh, over the past 12 months and look ahead to 2023 to some things that uh, we're looking forward to, perhaps uh, a wish list of things we hope would happen in 2023 so we'll be getting to that in a minute but before we throw it over to ken please note everyone that alan's uh sweatshirt matches the color of his book and with that and that was that planned not really <laughs> uh let's uh hand things over to ken with the final batch of beetle news for 2022 in all likelihood Thank you, Darren. And it's actually a very brief uh, newscast here. We start uh, with the news that the premiere of the new documentary, If These Walls Could Sing, all about the 90-year history of Abbey Road Studios, directed by Mary McCartney, just premiered on the Disney Plus channel. We're going to be talking about that, actually, right after we wrap up the news here. Yep. Um, another new Beatle book was released on December the 13th same day as the McCartney legacy. Uh, it's called The Beatles Discography, all the songs, albums, and EPs released in Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom, and United States with chart history by Carl Messacher. That's M-E-S-E-C-H-E-R. It's described as the essential reference guide covering over 300 songs, 100 albums, and two dozen EPs released by the Beatles in Australia, Canada, the UK, and US, plus other countries. This book is packed with songwriter, producer, label, and studio references, original and cover versions, trivia, and a compendium of chart data. So a lot of information packed in that book. Now, if you're, in, if you're into the charts, as I am, here's another book coming out. 
Um, it's due out January 21st by Michael A. Ventrella called Beatles on the Charts. All the group and solo albums and singles ranked by popularity. Our good friend, Glenn Greenberg, who recently wrote the bookazine for Time Magazine for Paul McCartney's 80th birthday, will have another bookazine coming out January the 27th <laughs> called The Book of Beatles Trivia. Also, Ken McNabb is a name hopefully you are familiar with in 2019. He wrote the fine book. Do I have it here? Yes, I do. And in the end, The Last Days of the Beatles, which takes you through the last year of the group, 1969, in detail, month by month. He just released a new book called You Started It, Rock and Roll's Most Notorious and Bitter Feuds. This is not a Beatles book, but part of it concerns the struggles in the relationships of Lennon and McCartney. Uh, it's just out on paperback now, and I just did an interview with Ken right before doing this show, which is now on my YouTube channel. His new book, You Started It. The newest issue of Guitar World has the Beatles on the front cover, calling the issue the ultimate Beatles tone guide. How to decode and reproduce George, John, and Paul's fab tones. It has transcriptions for guitar and bass. And there's also an article devoted to the 50th anniversary of the Wings classic album, Band on the Run. There's also a special collector's edition of Uncut magazine devoted to Paul McCartney, 148 pages long, called The Ultimate Music Guide with in-depth reviews of every solo album. Uncut's website reads, Uncut takes a look at the collaborations, parties, jokes about Eric Clapton, dot, dot, dot. A starry cast celebrate Paul as he turns 80. For more information on that, you can go to uncut.co.uk. It's, um, it's nice to know that John Lennon's one-to-one -one benefit concerts that took place at New York's Madison Square Garden on August 30th, 1972, was performed live just recently as a tribute to the concerts for its 50th anniversary. This happened in Moscow on November the 12th. This was done by the artist Buick McCain. That's M-A-C-K-A-N-E. You can actually watch a video of this tribute now on YouTube. Although I haven't seen it, you should be pleased to know, Alan, the McCartney legacy is reviewed in the latest mojo magazine have you gotten that yet sure yeah so so you've read what's that they like it okay well it's good to know more reason to go and get it yeah um we learned the passing of charlie gracie best known for the number one hit in 1957 butterfly he had a follow-up hit that made the top 20 in the u.s called fabulous which paul mccartney covered during the Run Devil Run sessions, he made it into a bonus cut. It's also just included in Paul's singles box set. The Philadelphia native attracted a number of young fans across the Atlantic, among them Paul, George Harrison, Van Morrison, and Graham Nash. And Charlie Gracie was 86. I want to remind everybody about a concert that I've brought up every now and then here on this show, which takes place every year, but the last few years because of COVID, it had to be canceled. The concert for Bangladesh Revisited by the Long Island band Wondrous Stories. And this will take place February 24th at the Space in Westbury, Long Island. They recreate the entire concert for Bangladesh. Not just George's material, but some Indian piece. <laughs> Maybe not the same one that Ravi Shankar played, but usually something like The Inner Light or Within You, Without You. And everything that was played at the concert for Bangladesh, the Bob Dylan set, the Leon Russell medley, uh, Ringo, Billy Preston, along with George's material. And it's it's one of the best concerts you will ever see. They not only do that, but they usually do like another Beatles album as well. When I've seen the show, which is twice, concert ran for about three and a half hours. You definitely get your money's worth and it all goes to cancer research, by the way. Uh, the concert for Bangladesh Revisited. And just one more reminder, the Fest for Beatle fans is coming up very soon, March 31st 
April 1st and 2nd at the Hyatt Regency on the Hudson. Special guests include Patty Boyd, Peter Asher, Mark Rivera, Joey Molland, Terry Sylvester, Mark Lewison, Jay Bergen, Kay Wo uh, Ken Womack, <laughs> Bruce Spicer, David Bedford, and our very own Ellen Cozen. And actually, hopefully we're gonna have our own panel together. It'll be the first time with all three of us having a panel at the fest. No doubt talking about the McCartney Legacy book. Okay, and that's uh, all the news I have for you this time. You know, uh, Ken and Alan, speaking of Charlie Gracie, um, I had the uh, pleasure of interviewing him at WFUV back, uh, it was 10 years ago, in 2012. I have it here on, uh, it's, it's on WFUV's website, actually. You can uh, do a search in our on-air archives. Charlie Gracie was at the station on... March 29th, 2012, with me. Hmm. And there's not much information about what we talked about. And I'm, I'm ashamed to say that, you know, you do so many interviews and so many things over the years, you can't remember the specifics. But um, you can listen to the interview. Uh, there is no video. But um, um, Charlie Gracie did visit me at WFUV and... Uh, so so go to WFUV.org, and uh, once you're at the uh, website, you want to go uh, looking around for the archives. I'm doing this live on, live on, I was going to say live on the radio, live on a podcast. So you go to the website, go to music, and click on Explore by Artist, and then go on, and click on Search and type in Charlie Gracie in the search engine and uh, it'll pop up. So, and I'm, I'm, you know, you know, was, was honored to do that interview back in the day. And um, anyway, sad to hear he had passed. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, thank you, Ken, with the news. Uh, before we actually get into the meat and potatoes of the show, today's show, uh, we were going to talk about if these walls could sing uh, which Ken men mentioned in the news, the new documentary, Mary McCartney's documentary on Abbey Road, which I had a chance to watch just two nights ago, uh, a couple of nights ago. And I know uh, both of you have seen it, or at least Alan's seen it. You saw it too, mm -hmm. Ken? Yes, uh, I did. So, all right. Um, your thoughts. Start with, uh, start with Ken. I thought it was good. <laughs> um, I kind of felt like it was way too short. And, um, you know, this is my mind, unfortunately, thinks like a producer being in this business. And I think about, you know, editing and what gets taken out of something like this. When you're dealing with a 90 year history to try to cover it all in an hour and a half is virtually impossible. And I did kind of feel like even though there's a lot of very enjoyable moments and they did sprinkle in a bit of Beatles footage in there, which they obviously had to do. And it was great to have interviews with Paul and Ringo in there. Um, it seemed very choppy to me. It was really good to see going all the way back to 1932. They actually had film footage of um, Sir Edward Elgar doing pop and circumstance with a full orchestra to have something that old, 90 years old footage of that was really nice. And there was a bit on some classical music from an artist that I wasn't really familiar with at all. And all of a sudden you see Cliff Richard and it's like, you're talking about the fifties there. There's a, a lot in terms of years that I feel they just jumped right past. I'd want to know more about the full history of EMI and obviously later on after the Abbey Road album, it's called Abbey Road Studios and all. But um, there's a lot of really great moments that I liked in there because I've seen the Beatle footage, you know, it wasn't new to me. I, I, I liked the fact that they covered um, certain artists that did session work there. And Elton John was one of those people. He talked about this story. He did session work early on in the 60s before he became really famous. And um, he played for a group called uh, the Baron Knights. And he actually, because of that, and they recorded at Abbey Road, 
they had a chance to see he got to witness Paul at the piano doing Hey Jude. Didn't see the Beatles do it. He just saw Paul, I think, alone. And that was a big moment for him, a young guy at that time, getting to meet Paul McCartney. Um, and I, I must confess that one of my absolute all-time favorite songs in my whole lifetime has been He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother by the Hollies. And Elton John played the piano on that, which a lot of people may not know. And I they, I, What's that? I didn't. Oh, okay. Um, but they isolated Elton's piano part for a bit, you know, and got to hear just what he played, which I thought was really cool. And um, there was some footage of Scylla Black, which I loved a lot, where she did Alfie. And Burt Bacharach was there in the studio conducting the orchestra to Scylla's great voice on, on that song, just to see that. And I'm pretty sure that was in the, the documentary video produced by George Martin, which came out several years ago, but it's still nice to see. You know, just to see Burt Bacharach in action, such a brilliant song performed that way. Um, but you got the feeling watching this that, you know, you had the Beatles, you had Scylla Black, you had, oh, Jimmy Page, I didn't mention, doing session work in the 60s in there and talking about it. Um, and you had Pink Floyd with Dark Side of the Moon there. And you had a few more recent artists like Kate Bush being represented. Um, there wasn't that much really covered. Um, they do go into how around 1979, I think it was, or 1980, they were losing money and they had to sell a lot of their equipment. And Paul ended up buying a lot of what they had there at Abbey Road Studios. And um, they survived by doing uh, film scores, uh, you know, recordings for Raiders of the Lost Ark and um, Return of the Jedi. And, and there was a great interview. And one of my favorite moments was John Williams being interviewed in, uh, in this documentary and explaining how he loved the sound in the studio and how different Abbey Road was compared to the other studios that he conducted an orchestra in. But I just felt that he didn't get enough of all the artists or m more of the artists that graced those studios. And I'm sure that there are a lot more famous albums that were recorded there. And I would have loved to have heard more about it. I got to imagine that there has to be a longer version of this. It can't just be an hour and a half. Um, but, you know, I enjoyed it. I thought it was good. I thought it could be a lot better. For all that said about Mary McCartney, you only hear her in the very beginning, in the middle and at the end. She's not really there throughout the whole documentary they kind of let the artists talk for themselves and um that's basically it. it it was enjoyable i'm glad that i got to watch it but i felt so much more could be done and maybe the fact that it was only an hour and a half because of that there were limitations with what you can cover whenever you're dealing with anything where you've got so many years there to represent and you're trying to do it in such a, a short amount of time you're going to miss miss out on a lot quite a lot and um but i still nonetheless enjoyed the footage that i saw um it still was worth my while it's great footage of uh shirley bassey talking about recording goldfinger that was actually part of the whole jimmy page segment there since he played on goldfinger and just explaining what it was like for her to sing goldfinger and what was required of her to hit this long note and sustain it for a very long period of time uh all that stuff is great um but i just felt like they could have done more it was good but it could have been better alan um yeah i agree probably for different reasons though um you know it was great seeing a lot of the footage of the individual artists the um uh i think principally the classical person you mentioned is jacqueline dupre cellist and her husband daniel barenboim pianist uh working mm. on sessions together she was really recognized as one of the great cellists uh of the time young as she was um and it was nice to have footage of her recording in abbey road um and of course the beatles footage and uh the the story of jimmy page playing on goldfinger now, that's one i didn't know i didn't know about uh elton john playing on uh, uh he ain't heavy either but 
but that didn't surprise me. You know, I mean, you'd hmm. expect Elton John to be playing on that kind of, you wouldn't expect necessarily Jimmy Page to be playing on Goldfinger. Um, so that was a great story. Um, it was, of course, striking that Elton John was wearing a New York Yankee symbol on his jacket. <laughs> I, I noticed that. You do, I would say it too. <laughs> um, but for me, you know, the, the, um, the problems with it in a way were that ultimately it became kind of a cavalcade of musicians who went through Abbey Road, which could be anywhere, really. You know, you could do the same documentary with the same musicians probably about, you know, Carnegie Hall. Um, a, a documentary about Abbey Road, I want to know what it is about that studio and the equipment and how the equipment has changed. And there was a little bit of that. I mean, you saw Elgar recording direct to disc back in the 78 era you know and and then and you saw a tape later on but none of that was really discussed very much um and i think that you know this is a studio and why is it one of the great studios you know we we had some people say that the room sounds great and and all of that but you know there there's a lot more that could have been gone into in that area and perhaps they felt it would be boring um, I'm sure there are ways to make it interesting, you know, and have the artists sort of parading through while you're doing that, you know, talk about the different kinds of equipment that the Beatles used at the beginning of their career versus the end of their career or, you mm. know, and obviously they, they did a little bit of the different equipment they would need to record film soundtracks. So, you know, some of that was there. It's just that I felt that ultimately it became just sort of a, a big parade of stars, which, you know, obviously the stars are what people are interested in, but the subject is Abbey Road. So I think, um, I think I would have, preferred a little different emphasis like you you know you say you think of as a producer when you watch these mm. things, you know um but yeah you know but it was enjoyable um no question about it i mean there were some great stories um uh, like that both of us have just mentioned and um you know it was great seeing the the fresh interviews uh even uh, Noel Gallagher, who, you know, I, I don't particularly care that much about Oasis, but it was kind of interesting. You know, he, he said, you know, most of my record collection was recorded in this room. Mm. Um, they just didn't tell us why that's the case. So, mm. uh, yeah, you know, uh, I, I'd be interested to see if there's going to be a longer cut. But of course, we know that if Disney puts it out on DVD and Blu-ray, it will have no extras whatsoever. <laughs> Disney doesn't believe in that. They'll give you less, actually, the edited version. Hmm. Yeah, right. Uh, my my opinion of, of the documentary was the same exact as the two of you, um, but uh, when it was over, I realized you one or two things you could do here. You could do something that was an overview, grabbing at highlights, grabbing at, um, at um, you know, moments in time that sort of told the story. And, you know, Mary McCartney kind of approached it, I think, in, in more of an artsy way, uh, as opposed to doing a strict history. Uh, which you would have needed more time um, and might have been more informative um, in terms of knowing the complete history of Abbey Road. But, you know, you know, I, I kind of treated it almost like it would have, was a book of photographs, just still snapshots, um, brief captured moments of the studio's history presented in a bite size, well, hour and a half form, uh, touching on the role that the studio played in classical music, the role that the studio played in pop, not just Beatles pop uh, in the 60s. And, you know, and then like adding Pink Floyd and adding Oasis for more contemporary, a little more contemporary, and briefly Kate Bush, and a little Elton John there. It, it seemed to me some of the observations were sort of out of left field and random. Yet at the same time, I thought, you know, even though they had Elton John there, 
And Elton really didn't talk about anything about his career and a connection, the connection to Abbey Road. Elton played sessions, and a lot of people don't know that. Mm. Um, he did a lot of things in a very short period of time before his career took off. And and I didn't know he played sessions to the point where he was playing on Holly's recordings, for example. Uh, I A lot of people know Jimmy Page was a session guy for a while. But also, you know, just to take, take that and say, listen, Abbey Road did this for, or, or, or played this role in classical music and in the 60s played this role on two of the enormously successful songs. And by the way, these two iconic musicians are examples of, of, of players who were not household names and were playing at Abbey Road on some important records. So she really did grab at some very key points mm-hmm. and presented the significance in, uh, of the studio in these little bite-sized chunks. The only problem was, as, as, as musicologists or whatever you want to call us, um, whatever, uh, we're looking for these nuggets along with everything else linking them all together um if any of that made any sense uh it was a nice sampler a nice way of looking at at the studio's history in again in a sampler box like a whitman sampler of abbey road studios um you eat a couple you want the other 50 candies Hmm. chocolates but uh Nope, this was just a little sampler box from Mary McCartney. And I love Mary McCartney. I love her work. Uh, So, you know, that was one of the things that drew me to it. It's very possible, you know, with all the craziness and going on, I might have even forgotten that there was this documentary. Uh, But, you know, Mary, for some reason, because Mary was involved in it, I've always thought she does some very tasteful things. Um, And uh, I enjoyed it again. It probably was enough, but not for like people like us who want to really go in there. I thought it was a little weird that you do a thing on Abbey Road and there's no mention of Alan Parsons. Um, I know Alan's been dealing with some like health issues, like back problems and stuff. I don't know. Perhaps he was not available to be interviewed, but you would think Alan Parsons needs to be uh, in this documentary because he came in at the tail end of the Beatles as the Beatles were winding down. Alan was a young, you know, as we saw him in, in get back tape operator. Uh, So he really was starting out his career and uh, working with wings and really being the fifth member of Pink Floyd when it came to the dark side of the moon. So much, so many of the innovations on that album, are Alan Parsons, like the clocks and time. Mm. Alan had just recorded a lot of clocks for sound effects library and thought, ha ha, I got something for your song time, guys, and broke out all of these uh, clock effects. Um, I don't know how much Alan Parsons' project work was done at Abbey Road, but just Alan is behind the scenes on those few things. You know, I thought it was weird that he wasn't brought into the picture, but um, the John Williams stuff was great. And having been in Studio 3 and hearing John Williams say it was a little small, I'm like, small. Studio 3, when you're in it, is enormous. Um, If you're a musician that likes to record in tight little intimate quarters, cozy, Abbey Road was never was not that I'm surprised that you don't hear more about it. It could be cold. You know, having a four piece band like the Beatles recording in this massive studio two. studio three is bigger, but two is big. And, you know, when they started out, just these four guys uh, with their instruments. um, I'm getting off tangent here a little bit, but um, it's an enormous place, a special place, and it was a good documentary, but it really warrants... I know there have been books, but it could warrant something, you know, a little more 
detailed about the history. There's going to be a book coming out on the dark side of the moon, which turns 50 on March 1st. And perhaps that will have a little bit of how Abbey Road played into the, the making of that album. But anyway, it was, uh, you know, the one of those things, as I like to say, I'd rather have it than not. Mm -hmm. It has value. There was some interesting stuff there. And maybe not quite enough for the hardcore um, music people like us. But, well, you know, you know I, I wouldn't necessarily have wanted more of the technical stuff at Abbey Road, but I certainly wouldn't mind a list of some of the best-selling albums that were recorded there through the decades. You know, even just to flash it on the screen without having any footage from rehearsals of it, just yeah. to give people a taste of what was recorded there. Yeah. yeah. See, I would be interested in both of those things, but I definitely would be interested in the technical stuff. I would have liked to have seen the room they recorded your blues in when yeah. Ringo talks about that. And and it's still sort of to me, all right, they recorded the song in this small room where you didn't tend to record the music. Well, I I I love the logistics of that. I mean, whose idea was it? Who squeezed all the instruments in there? How did you record? They had to be incredibly loud. How was that process of recording them in this small space? And let's see it. That's the kind of thing I would like to have seen in a bigger, longer documentary. Um, and in a book, again, there have been books on Abbey Road. I don't know if there have been any reference guides, but you could probably publish a book with all that information, Ken, mm -hmm. about what was recorded there. Um, whether in, in, in its entirety or partially and, you know, um, what was done in what studio. and mm -hmm. um, There wasn't um, a, a huge sense of what happened between 1931 and uh, maybe 1961 when Cliff Richards turns up. You know, the, there's like um, like three decades there we hear nothing about really. Right. Um, and also just little things like they mentioned that after the Beatles album, uh, Abbey Road, the studio's name was changed to Abbey Road. Don't you think they should have mentioned what year the studio's name was changed, which was 1976, by the way? Um, I only know this because I ended up having to sort of, I was looking into when the name was changed uh, while working on the book. And uh, it wasn't in any of the Abbey Road books. And it was really sort of hard to come by. And, uh, and finally found 1976 and thought, okay, well, you know, when they're in that point in the documentary, maybe it would be easier for the next person who has to research it if they actually said the year, which, you know, is not too much to ask. Right. So just little things like that, you know, also all the innovations, you know, we got introduced briefly in a still photograph to Ten Ken Townsend. Um, but what about all the stuff that he built for the Beatles, you know, the ADT and all of that stuff, you know, there's, there's, there, there is a lot of technical stuff that isn't just, you know, well, this piece of equipment is, does this, you know, maybe um, it could have been kind of interesting to show, you know, this group wanted this kind of sound and this is what we came up with so that they could have it, you know, that kind of thing. That's one thing. Yeah. I agree with you there. You know, there are certain techniques that were used in the studio that the Beatles were a part of that I'd want to know more about without getting so super technical. But that could you, have been explored. I know the I know the film was by uh, a McCartney, but I did think it, they maybe I don't know they glossed over Elgar a little. There probably could have been a few more minutes spent on what he did there, which was significant in not just pomp and circumstance. Yeah. Um, and the segment, and I, and I don't remember her name. I know Daniel Barenboim, but I, I can't remember the yeah. tell name. Jeff. I was familiar with her. I knew the name and I was watching with my wife who was familiar with both of them pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, they kind of appeared, you know, in the documentary. Uh, without, I think, a proper setup for the people 
who aren't, you know, too up on uh, classical music, even though these are major names. Hmm. Uh, still, I don't think I've ever seen what Daniel Baron Daniel Barenboim looked like, you know, so I wasn't aware that's who that was for a few minutes. Hmm. Um, you know, so maybe a little bit of a setup on who the who they were and you know their role and oh by the way these important works were recorded by them here mm -hmm. and you know that 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 was the kind of stuff that you know there was still a little room before you started making 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 it too tedious for the casual fan it, i'm not even sure if it was a full hour and a half i think it fell just shy of an hour and a half you know you probably could have pushed it two hours before you started getting the casual person of interest bored hmm. you know and we live in the age of also no attention span so right. you know i don't exactly. know you know the casual fan really wants to get down and dirty like we do that doesn't sound right <laughs> you know what i mean um but i mean i'm a pink floyd junkie i mean i love when they dive into i would have loved a little you know a couple of hours on the dark side of the moon and uh and wish you were here and you know but and the fact that and i think it's pretty cool uh roger waters talked about this um i think it's very cool the coincidence that pink floyd were recording the, the piper at the gates of dawn their debut and down the hall sergeant pepper's only hearts club band was being recorded so you had the greatest album of all time happening and one of the most important bands in, in rock history was just getting their start uh, down the hall with a former Beatle engineer producing, Norman Smith. Hmm. Yeah. So, what about uh, what about the zombies? Odyssey and Oracle. Was nothing. Yeah. No, I know nothing was said about nothing. the zombies there, but that was reported there. That would have been a cool and, thing to include, even if it's a mention, because I've if I knew that it was recorded at Abbey Road, I forgot it, you know. Um, yeah. And I mean, but they did do things like I didn't know Elton John played on uh, on a great, 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 great song that I'm embarrassed to say I heard for the first time uh, by the Osmonds. He ain't heavy. He's my brother. So did well, I. Their <laughs> version is pretty good. It's very it faithful. Um, you know, I knew that Jimmy Page pa played tons of sessions. Didn't know he was, you know, doing what he did. Uh, the interview with him when he was a kid was pretty, pretty comical because he did say something that I thought was a little attention grabbing, and I don't remember what he was commenting on. That what what he felt about the the um, uh, famous stars that he's worked with. Yeah, he was like, yeah, <laughs> a little disappointed. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm Jimmy Page. Don't you know who I'm going to be? Hmm. Uh, but anyway, so that's if these walls could talk, it could sing. Uh, I knew I was going to refer to it if these walls could talk. It's a must see uh, for everyone watching this. So, um, so let's go on to uh, the topic. A little bit of a year in review, favorites, highlights, uh, maybe a low light from one of you uh, and what we would like to see happen in 2023. I know we pretty much have an idea of maybe one or two things that will happen in 2023, but so it's a little bit of a wish list, uh, but uh, let's start with Alan and uh, let's look back before we look forward. Okay. Um, I suppose for me, the top of the list for 22 has to be revolver, you know, um that was a major release it made people who weren't already in the revolver is the greatest thing the beatles ever did camp uh made people understand why people feel that way um and uh it was you know it was a good package so a lot of nice outtakes uh the surround mix should have been included on a blu-ray in the set but when you could get your hands on it and when you could get the separations out of it uh there was a lot of good stuff to be heard in there um i think you know we 
we talked at great length about it. Um, the fact that it really was two CDs worth of material on five CDs. Uh, that is, you know, a pity. They really should rethink that. I don't mind buying five CDs, but it would be great to have five CDs worth of stuff. Um, exactly. So that was the top of my list. I think um, the Beatles in India film was I think that's something that will probably slip through the cracks and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, but was uh, was really interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it was surprising in, in a lot of ways because it was how it worked both ways, not just the Indian music influence on the Beatles, but what the Beatles meant to Indian listeners and uh, the relationship between George and India. It uh, that was I thought I was very uh, enlightened by that film, I would say. Let's see. Uh, do, are we going for a particular number of things or just? No, one? no. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Paul's 80th. Uh, well, the concert at Glastonbury, you know, which I sort of associate with Paul turning 80, uh, the end of his tour. That was really a highlight. Uh, that was, I think, one of the best recent McCartney concerts I've seen broadcast uh, and it was good sounds, good video. It was great to see the whole thing. And uh, so, so that's up there as an event for 2022 that was available to everybody, even if you couldn't get to Glastonbury. Um, exhibitions, you know, we had, here, uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's Get Back to Let It Be exhibition, which focused on that period, but also the Grammy Museum experience, uh, where we just had our, um, you know, launch event for the book. Uh, that was actually, you know, we got there early and got to walk through the exhibit, and it was really a nice collection of stuff, a lot of set lists really especially early set lists from when they're playing stuff that they didn't play anymore once they got famous lots and lots of covers and and uh things that didn't even make the bbc albums you know just really interesting stuff some stage suits uh paul's shea stadium suit and his bass um lots of posters and a couple of sets of lyrics. I think what you're doing, they had there. Um, so yeah, you know, that was the, the, those two exhibitions, you know, it's, it's, it's great that Beatles stuff from the time that isn't just sort of consumer memorabilia, but memorabilia that only the Beatles or people who were there at the time and happened to pick up a set list that they might have discarded or, or whatever, uh, you know, got their hands on. It's it's great to see that stuff. So those two and, uh, I, you know, I've got maybe a number of other things, but I, I, I should leave them to you guys so we don't uh, duplicate. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Any, anything uh, looking forward that you'd like to see in 2023 that a year from now we're talking about oh, yeah. this this happened or this came out or i guess the big thing would be um whatever they decide to do next in the beatles archival series and you've got really a couple of choices there you can either continue going backwards from revolver and do rubber soul which is you know an incredible album and you know, really would benefit from this treatment, I think. Or you could go back to the sort of date related anniversary thing and catch the 60th anniversary of Please Please Me and with the Beatles. And I think, <laughs> excuse me, we've talked about this, I think, in the on the show, that they might have to combine those because, you know, the outtakes are such that, you know, we're really talking about pretty much live in the studio and breakdowns and, you know, slightly different takes of, of this and that. And while they're fascinating for those of us who like to hear every second of what they did in the studio, it may not be that fascinating for uh, normal people out there. <laughs> um, and so maybe it would make sense to combine those two albums and and see what they 
what they have and what they can come up with and maybe throw in the um uh for me to you thank you girl and one after 909 session from march 5th 63 mm -hmm. in between those two albums um so let's see what else <clears throat> i think um probably next year it will be great to see either well disney's not going to reconsider how about if apple finds a way to rest the uh get back footage away from disney and put out a really good blu-ray with uh you know several more hours of material that i'm sure peter jackson would be happy to add i mean i should talk for him but from what he said to us when he was on the show i think um i think he would be happy to make it uh you know 10 12 hours whatever um so that would be great uh also would like to see the let it be film itself come out looking like the get back film uh uh, that would allow a number of things um, that if if Peter Jackson, for instance, didn't flesh out the uh, the the get back thing as it is and add more complete takes from the January 31st session, at least you would have the Let It Be film, which has the complete performances of all the songs they did down in the studio. So I'd like to see that restored. Um, and finally... The two Paul McCartney archival sets that we've been waiting for for some time, which mm -hmm. are London Town and Back to the Egg, not just because that's the period that I have to finish writing a book about this year. <laughs> also, <laughs> it would be really helpful, um, you know, because those those sets provide, you know, an interesting outtakes and not to mention interesting paperwork. Uh the the session sheets and Paul's little diagrams of how he wants you know the stereo to go and uh, and all of that uh, there there have been rumors that he's been looking at press to play too I think you'll be happy to hear that Ken okay. yes. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, yeah I think that's uh, probably enough for me for now yeah so he did um... yeah press to play yeah okay good. Very where nice. Did you, where did you hear that about press to play? Um, from some collector with reasonably good connections. It hasn't been published anywhere, but um, you know, it seems to be a possibility. I, I believe someone found that he's just sort of renewed the copyrights for all the material on press to play, and there has to be a reason for that. So. Hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Should we? Shall we go to you now, Ken? Doesn't matter to me. That's a nutty question. I mean, what else are we going <laughs> to jump to me in the middle? Yeah, why not? Why not? Uh, I'll go. You go first, Ken. Okay. Highlights of the year. I have to always include any new music at all from Paul Ringo. So EP three yeah. has to be in there. I'm just grateful that Ringo gives us anything new yeah. i know i've said this many times but at this point i feel so completely spoiled by the incredible catalog of the beatles the group and the solo years we have so much great music anything we get now is is icing on the cake it's um you know the fact that paul and ringo are still willing to give us anything new music and touring is, is a blessing and they only do what they want to do really so just knowing that alone is reason to celebrate. I especially love the song For Your Soul from EP3 because it's got a real soft jazz feel. It's something new for Ringo. Um, very well produced, World Go Round, I love a lot. All the stuff that he does with Steve Lukather um, and he co-wrote that song. Um, you know, it's just another EP, but I'm glad that he's keeping at it and giving us something, mm -hmm. whether it's one EP a year or two EPs a year. I prefer a whole album, but if all he wants to give us is an EP, I'm grateful for that. Um, also, I wanted to mention uh, Lennon, the Mobster and the Lawyer from Jay Bergen, who we had on our show. And I had the pleasure of interviewing two times in addition to that, just for the simple reason that it's it's a topic that hasn't been explored before. It's something that we've heard about, but only a little bit about this whole court case that involved Morris Levy. 
and um, you know the the copyright infringement over come together using just a few words from that from Chuck Berry's "You Can't Catch Me" and all the hassles that resulted between Morris Levy and John and with the record company and putting out the Roots album and all of that in detail. And just knowing what John said in court and how he handled himself in court, I felt was really fascinating to have the actual transcripts of everything that John said, how he defended himself and not wanting the Roots album out. And um, it's a really good read. It's a, it's a fast read. And Jay has been a wonderful guest. And um, just for something new that we hadn't heard about before and this kind of detail, I, I think is definitely worth our while. Mm -hmm. I like the work of Chris Engelhart and I have for many years. He put out his book Fully Uncovered. He's put out two books prior to this, which deals with the side projects of the Beatles, the songs that they either wrote for other people, songs that they produced or played on for other people. And it's it's a fascinating thing to to explore. It all started for me with the book All Together Now with uh, Wally Pedrasic and Harry Castleman with a chapter that was devoted to that kind of stuff, going back to early Lennon-McCartney songs, you know, for Billy J. Kramer and Peter and Gordon and Scylla Black and people like that, working your way up to come and get it for Badfinger, uh, Mine for Me for Rod Stewart that Paul wrote, the Everly Brothers on the Wings of a Nightingale. And that's, I'm talking about the Paul stuff. There's so much that they've done for other people Ringo drumming for other people, uh, John producing other artists, you know, like David Peel or Elephant's Memory and stuff like that. And it takes you all the way up into the present. George Harrison did a lot of guitar work for other people, a lot of one-off stuff for people like Paul and Oates and Belinda Carlisle. And if you want to learn about all that, it's to me, it's a fascinating part of their history, which doesn't get enough attention. And I commend Chris for keeping at it and staying up to date and you know that when i give news here uh, on every single show if i find out that ringo just drummed on colin hayes new album it's going to get mentioned here on the show it's that kind of stuff mm -hmm. um that brand new song that paul just helped to write um ever the optimist which i brought up i think in our last show um which he's not credited for just things like that Chris has kept up with that kind of work through the years. And so if you want to learn about that, um, his new book is called Fully Uncovered. It really is a combination of the two previous books and updating it all to the present. Um, I have to say Paul and Ringo's tours for the past year. What a, what a joy it was to see Ringo three times with the All-Stars in the middle of all this COVID crisis and Ringo getting it twice. And uh, certain band members, Edgar Winter, and I think Steve Lukather got it as well. The band still is absolutely amazing, so incredibly tight. And uh, you can see the joy in all the band members when they perform together and in Ringo, because uh, they really enjoy each other's company. And even though they're doing the same songs with very, with very little change from year to year, um, they still are getting a big kick out of doing this. And you can feel it when you see them in concert. We've said this so many times before, whether it's Paul, whether it's Ringo, it's a joy to watch other people in the audience, especially young people get into this who may have never seen Paul or Ringo perform at all. And, um, you know, I just believe that Ringo is having the time of his life on stage. He loves these guys and um, he's going to keep doing it as long as he's healthy enough to do it. Same thing with Paul. And on the subject of Ringo, I have to also include that brand new release, Live at the Greek Theater 2019. The only difference between that lineup and the more current one is that Greg Raleigh was the keyboard player there. The audio and the video is absolutely superb. You can hear everything so crystal clear in the audio and video. And the camera work that was done for the DVD and Blu-ray is outstanding. You know, there's something to be said about seeing all-star bands and having multiple uh angles great shots of two or three members at the same time seeing uh you know Ringo and Greg Bissonette on camera together and watching them drum together focusing on that seeing Ringo behind uh you know anybody up front on stage Steve Lukather or um Hamish Stewart 
or Colin Hay, you know, just to see the interaction between the band members and how, how much they're enjoying it. And what I do like the most about this, and I think I said this about Ringo with the Ryman, the, the video there, is how much that they must have had a lot of cameras, cameramen working on this, because every time Steve Lukather had a guitar solo, camera was right on it. Every time Greg Raleigh was doing something great on the keyboard for especially the Santana stuff, hands are on the keyboards, cameras are on it. And um, really outstanding work that was done overall for both the audio and the video. And as for Paul, got to see him twice. Got to see him at MetLife Stadium in New Jersey and at Fenway Park uh, in Boston. Super concerts. And, uh, you know, he's been with this band now for 20 years. Makes a few changes here and there from tour to tour. And I'm just grateful that he's doing anything. And um, no, his voice is not what it was during Wings Over America. Or even um, in the, from 89 through 93, even in the, the first decade of the 2000s, his voice was great. But it's still, for someone who's 80 years old, is pretty darn good. And to give you a concert that's near three hours long, how can you complain about that? <laughs> and also a, a personal thing with me at, at uh, the show in New Jersey, I was in the parking lot early on where I got to hear the sound check from my car. And what a treat that was because I could hear Paul clear as a bell singing and his voice sounded great during the sound check. I kept saying, save it for the concert. <laughs> but um, just the fact that Paul and Ringo are still out there doing all this stuff. And I, I still believe that as long as Paul's healthy, same thing with Ringo, he's going to keep on doing it. Of course, you got to put Revolver in there. Every single archival release is an event of the Beatles, and I love hearing mainly the outtakes. And there's always a handful of them that really are outstanding that I will always go back to, that different take I've got to get you into my life. I actually like the, the different take of... Um, here, there, and everywhere, which is just Paul's vocal without any backing vocals. Just add something when you just hear, it's it's a different vibe altogether when it's just one of them singing and you don't hear. It's Maybe it sounds more live, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, I love that, all the different takes of Enya Bird can sing, the long version of, uh, of Love You Too with hearing George play the sitar for a while. I, I could go for, another five minutes of that with George Harrison playing that because it's so fascinating. And the demo for Love You Too, I liked a lot. Um, yeah, and I I agree totally with Alan. We said this when Revolver came out. It's two CDs of material spread out on five. They could have condensed it. Um, but still, grateful that they're doing anything. Um, and I got to put the McCartney Legacy book in there. Anytime you learn anything new, um, you know, that makes it all the more worth your while, you know, and every single page practically that I'm reading of the McCartney legacy, there's something I hadn't heard before. And it's a combination of knowing about the sessions, knowing what's going on in Paul's personal life, how he handles the start of his solo career, you know, which he never had to do, be responsible for everything instead of being part of the group. You know, all of that and how he came out of the Beatle breakup and how it affected him and how he had to pick himself up. I mean, we've all heard many times about how depressed he was during that whole time. And Linda was there to encourage him. And he started doing the, the first McCartney album. And you learn about all the songs that he worked on, things that he started on then that wasn't released till years later. <laughs> You know, um, I love learning about all that stuff. Um, this, you feel like you're getting into Paul's head and how he had to deal with all he was confronted with at that time. You don't think about it, I suppose, when you're part of a group and you already have a manager like Brian Epstein or something like that. And he reached the point in 1972, he's starting a new band. It suddenly hit him. You know, I need a manager. <laughs> I also found it interesting that he reached out to um, Brian Epstein's assistant, Wendy Hansen, right? Yeah. He asked her to be his manager. Little things like that that I never knew before. And finding out 
what songs were recorded fairly quickly, learning that high, 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 he just did take after take after take, and he was never happy with it. You'd never know it from listening to the studio version of it. Yep. But um, stuff like that I find absolutely fascinating. So I can't wait for more of this. And um, definitely, you know, that book, Revolver and Paul and Ringo's Tours, top three of the year. Um, a few honorable mentions. I got I to gotta bring up Madeline Baccaro's book on Yoko Ono. In your mind, the infinite universe of Yoko Ono, because it really explains Yoko's mind and how it's so different from most people and how she thinks and the whole creative process behind what she does. And it helps you to understand why John was so fascinated with her. So it really goes into detail about her entire life, what influenced her and why she has a mind that's like no other. And uh, it's a it, you really should pick that one up. Julian Lennon's album, Jude, which we really didn't talk about here on the show. I thought all the songs were excellent. It's a combination of a, a bunch of old songs and, a, and some new ones that he put together. Bruce Spizer's book, Rubber Soul to Revolver. Um, the book on Shea Stadium, Top of the Mountain, The Beatles at Shea Stadium in 1965 from Laurie Jacobson. Fab Four Cities, Richard Porter, David Bedford and Susan Ryan. Um, you know, important locations in all uh, the, those, the major uh, cities that they tackle in the book, which is New York, London, Liverpool, and Hamburg. Um, those would be the highlights of the year for me. Pretty good list. Yeah. How about uh, a wish list for 2023? Okay. Well, I consider myself a Beatle fan that lives for today. And so anything that Paul and Ringo work on now is more important to me. Okay. So how much more do we have left? You know, I know I don't want to sound depressing there, but uh, it's a wonderful life. That's my top priority. We've heard about it for several oh, years now. Yeah, yeah. We don't know what the status is of that. Nothing's been said about it. I know because of COVID, it was delayed. I heard that it was supposed to premiere in London. Um, nothing became of it. And now we're not hearing anything about it. And from what I understand, Paul finished writing all the music for it. So I hope that there is a theatrical showing in London, anywhere where it would start, and a soundtrack album. So that would be the top priority for me. Obviously, I'd love to for Paul to put out a, a brand new album of all pop rock and the next album, the follow-up to McCartney three. Um, love to get another EP out of Ringo, another Beatles box set, which I mean, Alan said everything that I could possibly say about it. It could be rubber soul. It could be going back to please, please me. And with the Beatles, I can't see them doing something like a two for package with please, please me. And with the Beatles, you give more attention to each individual album, showing pride in the catalog, but I understand why you said that, Alan. Um, and I think, you know, if you release it separately, you give more time for each one instead of putting the two of them together. But we don't know exactly what's about to happen. And we still haven't heard anything about something with Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow Submarine. Um, so I'd love to see any box set. I'm happy with that. Um, the biggest disappointment for me in the past year isn't just It's a Wonderful Life and not knowing anything about that, but being told that sometime in New York City, the box set was going to come out. So I certainly hope that we get that next year. The only problem with all these archival box sets from the solo Beatles is if they're concerned about special anniversaries, Sometime in New York City came out in 1972. So if you're concerned about the 50th anniversary, that's that's this year. Then next year, you would have mind games. I can't see them putting out both in the same year. Um, 1973 was the banner year in the solo years of the Beatles. And they've had a lot of great years, but you had Red Rose Speedway, Ringo, Mind Games, Living in the Material World, Ben on the Run. Well, we've already got Red Rose Speedway and Ben on the Run for box sets, but we still need Living in the Material World, Ringo, which we've been hearing is a strong possibility for next year and Mind Games. I'd be happy with any of those. 
it would be the 50th anniversary next year. But then again, what, what happened with the concert for Bangladesh? You know, there was a press release that came out before COVID hit, which we brought up every now and then. I think it was in Rolling Stone where Olivia Harrison and Danny talked about their plans and it was all through the Dark Horse album and tour. Some kind of a video coming out for that. If they're concerned about 50th anniversaries, then they'd have some catching up to do. I don't know why it's all speculation, why sometime in New York City didn't come out or the concert for Bangladesh this year. But I'm happy with any of those releases. I want to see the box sets continue. And, um, and that would be it. All right. That's a lot to ask for, I know, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. If I were Santa Claus, I, I, I wouldn't want to get your Christmas list. Ken, <laughs> it's a Christmas book. Uh, Actually, but I should say the number one thing should be Paul and Ringo remaining healthy yeah. and happy. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, Ringo's a little more uh, visible than Paul is over the course of a year. So, uh, you know, it's, it's always fun to get a video, a little video update where, you know, Ringo is, is chipper and as, uh, uh, you know, carefree on mm -hmm. every video you get that, like, Oh, Ringo, Ringo's doing well, you know, he's doing jumping jacks on the beach. <laughs> uh, you know, I still, you know, he, he amazes me. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so, um, my turn, I'm going to probably repeat a bunch of the things that you guys talked about, it's but fine. for me, the highlights, well, different types of highlights, uh, seeing Ringo and his all-star band and Paul live again, of course, feeding off, extending what we were just talking about. I can't help but think that the show at MetLife Stadium in, in, in East Rutherford, New Jersey may very well be the last time I see Paul live. Not because he's not well or anything like that. Touring's tough on that scale of uh, the way Paul goes about it. Um, but, you know, that that sort of was on my mind the entire time that I was there. Um, I will admit to having the experience somewhat um, ruined by the placement of a a, a, a very large uh, speaker, which happened to be in my line of vision. Uh, I couldn't have like planned it. I can't hit lotto, but I could find that one seat on the other side of the football stadium <laughs> where an amplifier is in my, my way. Go five seats to the right or the left. And I think that was avoidable, but no, I found that seat hmm. on the other side. Like I was sitting like in one end zone looking at the stage almost exactly not quite just a little off center straight across which was fine for me it's a stadium they're going to look like ants i don't want a speaker that didn't need to be there in my way anyway so i digress but getting to see ringo and the all-star band and paul one more time of course and 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 seeing them active and getting of course new music from ringo uh ep3 um you know, since he's been doing the EPs, I'm sort of seeing what his logic is in EP as opposed to an album in that he's been able to give us more. He's been able to give us material more frequently. You know, instead of letting, uh, you know, uh, an album's worth of songs accumulate. You know, he'll work on a few things and put them out. And in a way, I think I kind of like that because we're seeing him more often. You know, so getting EP3 this year after two EPs last year and the concert, Ringo's back uh, on the road. I hope that he wasn't uh, too discouraged by the starts, starts and stops that he was faced with due to COVID, getting it himself and and members of the band getting it. And it must have been a frustrate, frustrating to try to conduct a tour in this day and age, you know, having to deal with things like that. And would that kind of like put a damper on the experience for him going forward? Just life interfering with doing something that he loves. We'll see. But thanks, of course, to being able to see Paul and Ringo live one more time. 
and getting some new songs from Ringo. Um, the Revolver box set, I'm not going to go into detail. Of course, I was thrilled it came out and it would be one of the highlights of the year. And I think one of the things that the Revolver box set did uh, that uh, is key is that it did show us that, yeah, once, you know, you know, they're going to keep going with these archival sets. We were wondering after Let It Be, do they go back? How far do they go back? How are they going to handle this? Are they worried about hitting anniversaries? Does that matter? We got our answer with Revolver, I think. You know, and the reception to it, it would shock me if they didn't do another, you know, look back. And I could kind of see what Alan was saying. I don't know if a Please Please Me, a Please Please Me set all by itself is bound to disappoint because we've been spoiled with the sheer volume of the box sets that have come out and it's not going to be there for please please me um so combining it and doing it maybe a 1963 box set featuring the two albums might be the way to go and maybe then if they're going to do something like that See, Beatles for Sale would take would would take the should get the short end of the stick if they did a combination a hard day's night help box set. I don't know. Anyway, so obviously revolver. That's that's an obvious. And seeing them live, AP three, and uh, and two two books front and center. Alan's Alan and Adrian's book um, was well worth the wait, uh, and. A treasure trove with a capital T, two capital T's, um, and Madeline Picard. I'm glad you mentioned Madeline's book because I think Madeline's book uh, is the definitive Yoko Ono. Mm -hmm. That's the one go-to place that you should go to. <laughs> That's why it's a go-to place uh, for all things Yoko Ono. So those those are two of the most important books. Uh, um, that have come out, and there have been a lot of books, and it's remar I find it fascinating that Madeline and Alan and Adrian were able to, in this sea of books, come out with two that really rose to the top. Well, just when you thought you've read and seen it all, two books that are essential editions. Didn't we hear about that already? Yeah, but no, but these are essential. Mm -hmm. So I hope Alan and Adrian are really getting cracking on volume two uh, because it's <laughs> a volume three to write after that. See what you started, Alan, the pressure you put on yourself? That's it. Um, Thanks, guys. <laughs> but uh, looking forward, looking forward to me is that you, you um, yes, sometime in New York City, I wonder what happened with that. And I wonder... If it had anything to do, maybe legally, maybe logistically, and 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 also maybe y Yoko's health maybe played into this a little bit. But I wonder if they were going to bring the one to one concert into a sometime in New York City box set because it would make the box set stronger. Yeah. Sure. Uh, it would also give you a complete picture of that. Well, yeah almost complete picture of that period of John and Yoko arriving in New York, making music with Elephant's memory. Who knows? Perhaps, I mean, they could even expand it beyond that to like approximately infinite universe about that period where John and Yoko were fully immersed in New York and, and had Elephant's memory there. Approximately infinite universe, Yoko's album, is with Elephant's Memory, and that f definitely feeds off of Yoko, some of Yoko's stuff on Sometime in New York City. Um, so perhaps there were production delays in not just doing Sometime in New York City it's alone, but the fact that maybe there was going to be other elements to it that caused the delay. Um, and I wonder, again, maybe with Yoko's health, some things had a uh, get got slowed down a little bit, but uh, we just, don't really know. But you know the possibilities are endless. 
what you can do with the sometime in New York City box set. You not only have the one to one concerts, you got rehearsals yeah. for the concerts. Yeah. What about the John Sinclair rally? You're making a you know? you're making a, a several packages. One really important document, if you somehow brought that all together, uh, you know, in one, you know, John Lennon, Yoko Ono, sometime in New York City, it will almost like be a complete period, because then after that, they separate. Yoko kind of quietly comes off out of the spotlight. You know, she did the one album, Feeling the Space. John's in L.A. now, The Lost Weekend. Before all that happens is this period, a politically driven period in New York City. It's a time capsule of also the city, too, that that era. So this, again, could be could have been could be production delays. I mean, the way they launched start of the year this year, 2022, what was it within days we already had coming sometime in New York City? So there was a lot. They weren't going to ditch. Maybe that. Well, I guess they could have. They could cancel it, even though they started what appeared like it was going to be a big promo campaign. So that leads off my looking forward to uh, something involving, um, and I would love to see something involving mind games. But sometimes in New York, some time in New York City has to happen first. Um, and of course, I'll throw in the, the next round of McCartney reissues, probably let a uh, London Town back to the egg. I wonder if Paul would combine the two or release two separate like he's done in the past probably two separate because they're two musically two albums that don't have a lot in common right. i don't think um i was intrigued versions of wings are two different versions right? yeah right the band's different um i'm more intrigued on the possibilities of what could be done with ringo's catalog especially since on our last show or the show before that the teaser of a possible Ringo box set for Ringo's third solo album I've been saying that if nothing else there should be an Apple box set of Ringo's his four albums released Ringo Starr the Apple albums um, uh, that should be done and I don't know if it's possible to do something more expansive because of the different record companies involved and I who knows who owns the tapes but you know Ringo's catalog could really deserve to be tied together in in a huge set bringing all the albums together but I'll be happy with you know an Apple set because it's been done for John it's been done for Apple it's been done for George you know we don't expect something like that from Paul but um so kind of like the Ringo album getting its attention by itself is fabulous. But if nothing else, hey, how about reissuing the Apple albums as one set? And um, really, the rest would be dreaming. You know what I mean? The uh, you know uh, reality, though, that's what I'd like to see happen. And I hope we're talking about these things in a year when we're wrapping up 2023. Boy, the Ringo box set was great. Boy, Darren, you hit the nail right on the head with sometime in New York City because we did finally get, you know, the one to one concert in its entirety and maybe two couple of discs of performances, even from other artists um, uh, that were that participated and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, but, mo you know, on a, and on a personal note, I want to thank I'm very thankful for this show uh and for working with the two of you um it is i i consider it a a privilege and i kind of in my mind am making sort of like an i'm not speaking of them because of what happens to new year's resolutions but i'm hoping that you know it, to play a role in 2023 of making uh you know this show something even a little more special and yeah what the hell i want it to be the best damn podcast that <laughs> of any topic ever so what i'm going to need for that to happen is volume two of your book alan has to be out uh and ken we need you 
you know, on a major syndicated, you know, I'm kidding. But no, <laughs> in no seriousness, I'm, you know. I'm always trying for that. But, you know, you know, this show to me uh, is something I'm very thankful for. And I'm looking forward to the possibilities because there are many untapped ones. And I know some of the things that pop into my head that I never act on uh, where, you know, this could be even a cooler thing than it is already. Hmm. And uh, so that's where I'm going to leave it for 2022. Can I add and, one? Yes. <laughs> um, actually, most of the rest of the things on my list that I hadn't read, the two of you had picked up on. I had Madeline's book and, and Spicer's book. and But um, one thing that had, didn't get mentioned is May Pang's film. Um, a lot of people didn't see it because yeah, it no, was, I, you know, just that happened. small screening in New York the, they did have uh, you could stream it briefly you know while that those screenings were on really good film um, she's working now on getting a, a broader distribution deal and I hope she gets it because um, you know it's it's got some great footage it has uh, uh, good interviews and th and it's you know it tells the story we know the story basically but uh you know goes into a little more detail about uh, you know how the so-called lost weekend came about and you know how it ended um and it's it, i i really uh i really liked it as a film um and the only only other thing that i wanted to mention um was the get back blu-ray set came out in 22 and of course, you know, it's the get back Blu-ray set, you know, get back, get back. Um, and I should, you know, take one more opportunity this year to excoriate Disney for not having extra material on that set because it should have been, you know, we all had the files. We all had high res files of that program within a day of the first broadcast you know, so when you put out a Blu-ray, we're all going to go buy the Blu-ray, but come on, give us something extra, you know, even if it was just an edit of the rooftop concert without the non-Beatles performance elements of it, so that if you want to watch the concert, you can just have that, you know, uh, and but more than that, really, you know, there should have been all the com complete performances of the January 31st stuff. Uh, some of the performances that weren't shown complete in the rest of the film maybe could have been expanded to be complete. You know, there's so much that could have been done. Uh, but for Disney to have a, a, a rule about we don't think people are interested in director's cuts, they're out of their minds. Anyway, Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> Can I? Good. Yeah, um, I want to... Really funny. We may be uh, the fam, my family. We may be making a, a little return trip to, to, uh, to Disney World. I was thinking of maybe I have a T-shirt made up. Put get back out on Blu-ray, damn it. <laughs> with extra stuff. Yeah. With extra stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got to have that with extra stuff. <laughs> All right. I just wanted to say, since you brought up some time in New York City, that's one of those releases, kind of like back to the egg where you can see so many possibilities of what you can add to it and since we mentioned the one-to-one -one concerts there were two of them okay so you're going to have both of them in there uh is it going to be video for both audio for both like i said there are rehearsals for that what about and i know i don't know how this is going to work with clearing it tv appearances on dick cavett or the mike douglas show because she had John and Yoko with Elephant's Memory there doing mm -hmm. political songs. And I yeah, mentioned the John yeah. Sinclair rally. I hadn't thought at all about approximately infinite universe. Although it is kind of interesting when you think about Plastic on Band that the the Blu-ray audio had Yoko's Plastic on Band on there. You know? So who knows? Like I you said, Elephant's they, Memory I, is on is on um approximately infinite universe yeah yeah, yeah. so and um i i just thought of one more thing when you were making those connections there the mike douglas shows you brought up a very good point yeah. uh, now we've made sometime in new york city this box set now we've turned just we've 
pr pretty much turned into a 50 disc box set um that's going to come in, in 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 a little miniature empire state building um but uh that's a good point because those uh those those videos i love them i mean i have a um a vcr kind of a that works it's a fairly new one but it's a very basic model and but and when you're watching tapes on like a modern tv they they're pretty awful but mm -hmm. um you know i still value having those uh mike douglas shows and that's to me that's like boy you got to put put these out again yeah it's like this is great that that only came out on VHS. Yeah, right? that never yeah. came out on DVD. Right. I think there was a, I think there was some sort of a South American release on on DVD. Okay. Yeah. I don't know but why it's... there, but what what a an important part of history to have John and Yoko be the co-host for a whole week. That should always be available. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I think about sometime in New York City. I think about Back to the Egg. So many possibilities there. That you can do with that. So I didn't mention any archival release from Paul, but I'd be happy with any of them. But especially press to play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm just seeing Mike Douglas again. Mike Douglas and that and that so those shows were really funny seeing the generations clash. But um, anyway, so yeah, I guess that's uh, that's it. We summed up the year. We made a, uh, we planned out 2023. And I guess that's all, uh, that's all she wrote for our last show of the year in all likelihood. I keep seeing this all likelihood, like, uh, but it's probably going to be our final show of the year. Uh, of course, the three of us are, are incredibly thankful to you. Yes. Yes. You for uh, spending the year with us and watching and listening to the show. Um, needless to say, without you, we'd, we'd be nothing. Ourselves. We'd be nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you. We look forward to uh, uh, doing more things for you in, in 2023 and hope you'll take the ride with us. And um, we'll, we'll see all other ways that uh, Alan could color coordinate with his, uh, with his book cover because I've noticed that your water bottle Is red. <laughs> I'm so. really color coordinating with my oh, oh, look at that. seven guitar, my first electric guitar <laughs> from when I was 14. I still love that guitar. Hmm. Anyway, but uh, yeah. So, oh, and and one other thing that I'm looking forward to is Beetle Fest 2023, uh, because it would be the first time, no, second time that the three hosts here, us, will be together. You know, and uh, it's we, the first one other, time. One other, well, at least with me, eighteen white albums. Monmouth. Okay, well, that wasn't the fest, but right, but right, the first, you know, this first time we were all three in the same room, right? You know, and see what happens. You know, when when one a.m. rolls around and Alan's had a few cocktails in him, does he put a lampshade on his head and go <laughs> rolling down the uh, the uh, the corridor of the hotel? Ha ha ho ho. <laughs> But anyway, um, thanks again, everyone, uh, for a great year. And I hope you enjoyed the shows. And uh, you want to wrap up, uh, Alan, contact info. Okay. Um, easiest way to get me is on Facebook, um, either just at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Uh, we have a, uh, a joint email address for the show, which is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We have a Twitter feed at Things We Said Fab, and we have two Facebook pages, Things We Said Today and Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. We post the shows, uh, we post usually the YouTube one on those two Facebook pages and various other places around Facebook. You can also find an audio version on Podbean or Apple iPodcasts or iHeartRadio or lots of other places where fine podcasts can be had. And um, yeah, just wishing everyone great holidays and happy new year. And Ken? Uh, you could always reach me directly at my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. 
If you want to listen to my syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing, the easiest way to do that, there's one website where you can listen on demand, and that's uh, for the radio station WFDU. Go to WFDU.FM, go to their archives uh, page there, click on uh, the title of the show, Every Little Thing, and you'll always have the last two shows that have aired on the radio station, and you have two weeks to listen to each one of them. Uh, my other podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. You can listen to, well, the next show is going to be January 9th. It's always on Monday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern. It's every other Monday night. And um, actually, uh, you guys watching will know this for the first time. The show we're going to do, the first show of next year will be the songs that John Lennon wrote uh, during the last five years of his life that he didn't release. A lot of the stuff that was on the Lost Lennon Tapes radio series would be talking about that. So that's on January the 9th, 9 p.m. Eastern. Go to our YouTube channel, uh, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, and it's on all the audio platforms as well. Don't forget, I also have my own uh, YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. Just interviewed Ken McNabb, who, as I said before, is the author of End in the End which came out three years ago, The Last Days of the Beatles, and his brand new book, You Started It, Rock and Roll's Most Notorious and Bitter Feuds. So there's a brand new interview with Ken, two Kens together on Ken Michaels Radio. And there'll be more interviews to come on there. My website, kenmichaelsradio.com. You can win the McCartney Legacy, Volume 1 with uh beatles trivia this particular week it's a beatles uh christmas trivia question so make sure you go to the beatles trivia and games page at kenmichaelsradio.com you'll have 10 prizes to pick from one of which happens to be the mccartney legacy another one is ringo star at the greek theater 2019 so many great prizes i give away every single week on my website uh through my trivia page so check that out and uh, yes, wishing you all happy Hanukkah, a wonderful Christmas time. Happy Christmas. I want to be Santa Claus, all that stuff. <laughs> and uh, thanks for being here this whole year. I'm looking forward to 2023. Right. All right. Um, and as for me, I'm on Facebook. I have two pages, Darren DeVivo. Uh, there's also Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ and Beatles podcaster. One of them, you click follow or like, whatever the button is these days. Uh, the other, send me a friend request, and uh, we'll be connected that way. Um, you could shoot me an email if you wanted to at DarrenDeVivo at WFUV.org. Now, as for on the radio, um, we're recording this on December 20th, and tonight is my last show at WFUV for the year. I've taken, taken a couple of weeks off, uh, so I'll be back on the air on Wednesday, January 4th at 10 p.m., and you can catch me 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Monday through Thursday nights and Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4 uh, at WFUV in the New York City area. We're at 90.7 FM and uh, 90.7 FM HD2 as well, uh, but you can listen anywhere on our website, WFUV.org or uh, get our app, download our app, and you can listen there. Uh, and again, like I say, two weeks, I'll be back on January 4th at 10 p.m. And uh, really, that's about it. As for us, we'll be back at you at some point during, I guess, the first half of January with our first show for 2023. And uh, for Ken Michaels, for Alan Cozen, I'm Darren DeVivo. Things We Said Today, Happy Hanukkah. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Merry Crimble, and peace and love. And we'll see you next year.